Welcome to a bonus episode of the Voice San Diego podcast. I'm Scott Lewis, Editor-in-Chief at Voice. This week, Sarah Libby and I, along with Andrew Keith, spoke with Councilwoman Monica Montgomery. She represents District 4 on the San Diego City Council. She was elected just a few months ago and had a lot of big promises and says she's been keeping track of them so she can make good on them. So we asked her about those, about the future of the district, housing, education, and policing issues. She's very passionate about police reform, and there's been some incidents in the news that she addresses. So I hope you enjoy it, and thanks for listening. Okay, we are joined in the Great Voice San Diego podcast studio by Monica Montgomery. She's the city councilwoman for the 4th District in the city of San Diego. You've been in there maybe about 112 days or so, it seems like. A little more, but there's, like I say, it's dog years. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> You know, um, I, I was just going to jump right in. You know, I, I see a lot of people run for office, really fire it up. They've got all these uh, this vision of how to change things. And then I, I've seen it countless times. People get in, they settle in, and then it's this like the, the game, the drama is so consuming that it's, it's hard for them to maybe see or to make big things happen. Uh, what has your experience been like so far? It's really been great. I'm, I'm enjoying myself. Um, I'm very intentional about remembering the things that I st- said on the campaign trail um, and really sticking to those. And then if there are issues inside the walls, communicating those outside the walls, just communication is like a really, um, it's a really big thing for my office because we know that some things we may not be able to do, some things we may not be able to do right away. Um, and I, you know, what I learned on the campaign trail is just people really do want authenticity and truth. And uh, even if they don't like what you're saying, they'd rather hear you say it um, than just to kind of go into sort of the black hole of City Hall. And so um, I'm enjoying myself, you know, um, try, just trying to stay true to the promises. Yeah, one of the things that I picked up during your campaign was uh, how how much dissatisfaction there was in your district around people who said, like, even if I disagree with your predecessor, we don't hear from her. And it doesn't seem like she's hearing us when we say that we want this or we want that or we don't like these things. Have you put anything specific in place to, to try to make sure you have a better communication system or that there's a better way to talk to your constituents? Yeah, definitely. We do actually have a communications plan, um, and we try to stick to that. Um, I, I think that everyone has that lens. Leadership is important. That's If I say that it's important, I'm grateful to have the staff that tries to implement that um, in every aspect, in, um, in the bigger, wider city communications, in the everyday community groups, you know, um, we just have a daunting task and we're trying to hold up our end of the bargain for mm-hmm. the people. You said you were very intentional about remembering what you said. What does that list look like and what's on it? Well, a lot of it is in uh, the work plan, the public safety and livable neighborhoods work plan, our, our budget memos. Um, it's just, for me, I have to be intentional because you're absolutely right, Scott, when you said in the beginning, it's really uh, once you get to City Hall, uh, the dynamics do change. And so um, I have to remind myself because I don't think I'm above uh, anyone else or above changing. And so I have to be intentional about um, the things that I have said. So that's that's CRB mm-hmm. um, changes. That's um, looking at racial profiling and implementing uh, uh, policies for fair and impartial policing. You know, that is uh, building up the Valencia Business Park, um, and more economic development in our community so that we can have a balanced a balanced approach to development in District 4. Um, it's the Oak Park Library. It's the Emerald Hills, uh, <laughs> you know, neighborhood park. It's, you know, the bigger citywide issues, and it's the very uh, focused community issues. Wanted to talk about some of those policing issues. Um, recently, the San Diego police chief held a press conference to respond to a 
video that was being kind of spreading online of, of police officers uh, beating a black man. Uh, were you satisfied with his um, response to that video and his explanation for it? I've looked at all the video uh, from both what I saw on social media and what's available to us from body-worn cameras. And I can tell you, uh, I believe my officers did the right thing. I believe they used the right amount of force to take a very violent and dangerous person into custody. So um, I did, you know, sort of release this statement yesterday is a quote just saying basically how I feel. I'm going to stick to accountability and transparency. I have not seen enough yet. Uh, enough details and facts have not emerged for me to be happy with that. Um, I am really focused on um, police reform, and I know that there are larger uh, societal issues, and I bring that up just based on some of the comments. I mean, um, I, I need to see more. And so I, I will say that I, I definitely need to see more. I, you know, I have talked to the chief. I am a little bit disturbed about uh, the uh, violent, dangerous uh, comments. Um, we don't use those all the time. And I'm concerned about the way that we view each other, which in turn has an effect on policing. And so, yes, I'm working on police reform, but there are also larger societal issues that I think we just have to consistently work on. What do you, th what do you mean how we see each other? So, you know, I, I have to go back um, and, and look, but I, what I have noticed in general is that when we have a larger, these sort of uh, mass shootings and such, um, uh, and the, uh, alleged suspect may not be a person of color. We approach that a lot differently than we do with uh, people of color uh, in, our, in the way that we speak about each other. You know, again, going back to the reference, violent, dangerous. Um, that may have been the case, that may have been the perspective, but um, it's also, it could be the perspective in, in a lot of other types of crimes and shootings. You're talking about so, how the police chief described the man yes, involved in this. Yes. Okay. I have a concern over that. And that's something that the chief and I talk about often. I don't think it'll be a surprise for him to hear me say that. Um, and um, again, I'm not specific to the facts of this case. I just do have, I, ta I, I take issue with that. Have you taken a position on Shirley Weber's bill that would change the standards guiding police use of deadly force? Yes, I have, AB 392, yes. um, where actually the resolution in support is coming to the council next Tuesday, May 14th. Um, in the afternoon session, um, we did uh, work closely with the council president's office to get that on the docket. Um, I am in full support of AB 392 and the concept of changing what the standard should be to use deadly force. I'm very much in support of that. Have you learned anything since you got elected that has affected your perception of this issue, your conversations with police or the police chief, for instance? I've always had the same perspective, which means that when I say police reform, I do mean, uh, you know, look, taking another look at the use of force policies and civilian oversight. At the same time, part of my platform was ensuring that our police officers are paid properly and staffed up properly. So I think that it gets to a larger issue of I'm absolutely for um, AB 392. I'm absolutely for uh, the Community Review Board on Police Practices changing and, and having subpoena power. Um, and I don't think that those uh, things are radical or uh, outlandish. I think they're very reasonable. Um, I think that there's not another standard that we use that was implemented in 1872. You know, the reasonableness standard goes back to 1872. Um, what other uh, industry do we look at and not change and modernize those standards, especially when we're dealing with how we, we interact with each other? Hmm. So, What about, so on the campaign trail, you know, this was a, a topic you, you spoke about often, um, and one of the main specific policy areas that you wanted to address was, as you mentioned, the subpoena power for the review board. What's the process on, on that right now? Where does that stand? And um, do you have any sort of expectations for a timeline in, of those conversations? Yeah, uh, we're still working on that. 
um, we'll be coming out um, with those fairly soon. Um, and, and so because it is a, a potentially a charter change, mm-hmm. then there's a, a whole uh, process that we have to go through. So um, when we get the dates and everything is solidified, I'll definitely put it out there. But we are working a lot on just making sure that everything is right. The last time it went forward, there were a lot of procedural issues that came up, and we want to ensure that that doesn't happen again. Yeah, so as a charter change, it'll have to go to a ballot. So 2020, something that you think is in the realm of possibility? I think it's in the realm of possibility, yes. We did a story a couple weeks ago about Porter Elementary School uh, and, and some of the community concerns there. There was a whistleblowing sort of a school counselor that was quite upset about how things were going. It's one of the nine schools in, in, in San Diego that are uh, listed as the most underperforming in the state. 22% of students were chronically absent. I remember before you were elected, you went to the city council and you said, many of our kids are bust out based on what we perceive to be a lack of performance from our schools. And I do believe that if we had representative that better represents the community on the board, we wouldn't have as much a problem with that. Is that something you you still feel or feel more or see more now? Yes, I feel the same. And specifically, I meant um, the issue around district-only elections. Yeah. Um, again, uh, I, I harped on this during the campaign because I was able to, I feel like I'm able to really represent District 4 based on the way that elections are conducted. So, um, you know, it's when it's a citywide election um choosing a person for a district like subdistrict e um the the school board that really we come with our own set of challenges i think the closer someone is to the community the better and that 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 absolutely has not changed um now you know i'm definitely am working with the school board trustee i've seen her at quite a few events and everything and i it's so many parents come to me with issues around school. Um, I'm very limited in what I can do, but you know, whatever I can do, I try to. Mm -hmm. That issue of district elections, do you think that that's something that the council's willing to tackle in the next year? Um, There is a state bill on the table um, that would possibly seek to make that change, but Shirley Weber said that she's kind of giving it an extra year to allow the council to try to tackle it itself. Yeah, I hope so. Um, I, I'd be willing to definitely take a take a look at it and, and I think do what what I believe is best. Um, it, I, but I you know I can't speak for for other council members, but I I definitely think so. You know, you mentioned just that that you're limited in what you can do. That the city of San Diego doesn't really have a direct role in the school system, but it's a major issue in your district. Something you talked about on the campaign trail. Um, when you spend time in the district, people talk about it. It's not like their conversations are limited between the responsibilities of one government agency or another. Um, Do you wish that the city had more of a role in in that system? Well, what my hope is, is that um, we can expand um, the, um, what my hope is, is that the school board, that we go to district only elections that we possibly look at having staff for trustees um, because it just is it the city has a we have a lot to deal with Mm -hmm. Um, we were just speaking about the things that have happened in this week alone Um, and I while I am not the someone who likes to uh, kick the ball to the other court I really you know sometimes it can be disingenuous and we can use the process uh, against the people Mm -hmm. Um, at the same time, there is a process and there are responsibilities. And so, um, you know, I, I believe that we can get, um, you know, the school board kind of the resources that it needs to pursue um, the concerns of the community, um, whatever that looks like. Mm. Well, I couldn't help but um, feel a bit of deja vu when you brought up uh, Valencia Business Park. I remember writing about it or reporting about it in 2007. Uh, in you know, I remember touring the area and, and the the thirst for development, for seeing something happen in those in those big plots of land was was acute then and it's been 10, 12, 15 years in some of these cases. 
What are you most excited about, about the development that could be happening? And what are you most frustrated about? I actually heard a story that you were telling the mayor's office for somebody that you were not going to act on something they, they want until you get a restaurant in district four, a sit down restaurant. Uh, what are you most excited about? But what is also still really frustrating as far as the stuff getting built and not built there? I am really excited about the potential. I think that we still have enough land in district four to have that, um, a lot of development that includes um, housing, you know, uh, at all different levels, uh, a business park, um, which is what the land that we're speaking of now was originally supposed to be, um, retail, um, you know, commercial. Uh, really, we have a great opportunity there, and there is a lot of interest. Um, contrary to what um, folks may believe, there's a lot of interest. And so that's what I'm excited about. I am really frustrated about our city not taking advantage of all the people who are interested in, in developing in District 4 specifically and in the city as a whole. I think sometimes we back ourselves into a corner and don't get the best bang for our buck because of our relationships. Um, and so that is what I'm most frustrated about. Um, but I'm hopeful that we will begin to open the doors um, so that we can get what we need for our communities. Can you be a little bit more specific? What, like, what, are, the, um, what are some opportunities that might have been lost in your district that were uh, otherwise pursued because of a relationship? Um, I will be as specific as possible sure. and just talk <laughs> about the Valencia Business Park yeah. where you just mentioned, uh, Scott, that you had written about it back in 2007. Mm -hmm. And we have had people that have shown interest in, in that piece of land since then. And you can drive by it and see that there has not been any development on it at this time. Now, there have been complications with it being a former redevelopment um, agency property and uh, all of the changes at the state and then you know some of the, the decisions that staff made at the city I think that were um, good good decisions on how to move forward but just didn't work out mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day we have some shovel ready property right there ready to go um, there ha there has been interest and there has been um, a desire to um, not um, fully take in all of the interest and evaluate it for what it is. Mm -hmm. You're saying there's people who had money to invest who for whatever reason the city wasn't able to help them get that job done. For whatever reason. For whatever reason. <laughs> all right. <laughs> let, the, let the record show she smiled very broadly. There. <laughs> uh, so on, on this topic, on development generally, uh, the, the big conversation across the state on this right now is uh, SB 50. Um, there's a bit of a uprising of folks in, in town that are asking the city to, to weigh in in one way or another. Uh, SB 50, as it's written right now, um, for listeners, this is a bill that would, in many ways, mandate a certain level of development be allowed within proximity to transit stops so that cities wouldn't have the opportunity to sort of suppress certain types of development um, based on community pressure or other decisions that they might make. Um, what is your thought on SB 50? Is, has, is it something you, you think about? Yes, it is um, in a couple of different contexts. Um, and, and I think that I've, if I um, wasn't thinking about a regional approach and how other cities in the county approach the issue of housing, um, then I might have a different perspective on SB 50 because um, I think the city of San Diego does a little bit better of a job than, you know, uh, other, uh, mm -hmm. other cities, um, in the County. And if I had not seen that for myself and serving on the arena subcommittee, the mm -hmm. regional housing needs assessment subcommittee over at Sandag, um, and you know, Sandag transportation, then I might view SB 50 a little bit differently, mm -hmm. um, but I know that there is a need to um, do a little bit more than incentivize mm -hmm. housing in, in a lot of different areas, closer to job centers um, and the like. So um, I generally, 
you know, I always have an issue with local, with taking away some some local control. Um, that's just, you know, it's a very controversial issue. You all have experience with my community and knowing that folks are very protective about, you know, uh, preserving uh, certain aspects of their areas. And I get that. Um, <laughs> sometimes it can turn into um, just a, a, a lack of in being inclusive mm -hmm. to all types of people. Yeah. That is, we are very inclusive. We have a lot of, uh, we have independent living facilities. We have affordable housing uh, developments going up. We are very inclusive. I, I do think that everyone needs to share mm -hmm. that perspective. And so I'm, you know, I understand why SB 50 is going forward. I see a lot of holes in the in the arena uh, approach and allocations mm -hmm. um, and that maybe SB 50 might shore up. And, and another uh, thing is I hope it would help us to concentrate on building job centers outside of the areas where they already are. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really just um, allowing folks to have access to good careers and good jobs where that uh, low to very low to low to middle income housing is. Yeah. So if to make sure I'm hearing it right, your experience at, at Sandag on the, the regional conversation around housing has made you more uh, more open to this sort of uh, bill that in, in essence takes away local control to some extent. Yeah, an understanding of why uh, something like this would come forward at the state level, mm -hmm. you know, because of there is there is resistance, and it's just it, I think it's a it's a process. I think some people probably will never change. I think some people may change with more education, um, and it, you know we are in a crisis, um, and and it is time to to act now. What that looks like and what all the amendments will be, I think it's still up for discussion, but. But I definitely understand a mandate as opposed to continue to incentivize. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing the affordability crisis in, in your district um, grow as well? Are you seeing home values and rents go up a lot? Are people complaining about that? Probably not as much as City Heights where, <laughs> um, right. you know, it's like rent, it's gone up about 75%. I don't think that it's to that point, but I do... Um, believe we have a level of that in addition what I see the most is that you know younger people it's 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 harder for people to go get out and uh, sort of live a life of their own mm -hmm. um, and that you know that that's an issue you know, that's mm -hmm. an issue I've noticed a lot a lot of white acquaintances of mine who are, are choosing to move into the district I think in a in a uh, way I hadn't seen before uh, as it is an affordable opportunity and is there a gentrification concern growing at all in the neighborhood yes absolutely mm -hmm. um, there's a gentrification concern um, and you know I share that concern as well I, you know really it's important to me to preserve the history of district 4 I talked about that a lot during the campaign um, it's 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 very important for me to do that and to, you know to I represent District 4 across all the diversity. Um, and I also know that it was a place where African Americans, you know, were redlined out of the rest of the city. Uh, and we need to acknowledge and recognize that and appreciate the accomplishments um, that a lot of folks have made um, in making, you know, District 4 um, a, a wonderful place to be. Um, gentrification is a concern and it always seems unfair that you know resources restaurants and those things follow um, gentrification or, or mm -hmm. when like you said when your white acquaintances move into the neighborhood it's just, it's unfair people have been there these are working people a lot of them work for the city the county you know uh, firefighters um, and, and still we still have some police officers. We have a lot of retired folks that really want to see that, you know, and, and it's really it's only fair that they get to see it um, as it is right now. Yeah, right? What do you I mean, what do you think the best tools the city has available to make sure that as economic development occurs and things can, you know, you, you improve these areas, things like the Valencia Business Park, that the people who've lived in District 4 for generations get to 
benefit from those improvements? Yeah, I mean, I have a couple of ideas around that. I think we do really need to focus on as we build um, the people, the, the local hire aspect. Mm-hmm. I think it gives people the opportunity to take advantage of middle class careers so that they can stay in the communities that they're building up. I also think there needs to be a focus on small businesses and economic co-ops and assisting smaller businesses that the people that are from the community that have had these dreams, you know, to be a part of the community and be an economic driver in the community. Um, I, I think those those things are very important. Again, this is why I focused on it, the development being balanced. I think the more um, we are inclusive about the different uh, income levels, um, it, it decreases segregation um, where we can we can all enjoy together, but that folks don't get pushed out. And that's another reason why I think SB 50 is, is sort of important because again, the RENA allocations right now don't really, um, don't have a mechanism to track how many people do get pushed out by development. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really, really important and something that we um, need to track and keep our minds on. I have two political questions you gotta get in before you leave. Um, one is, uh, the city council decided to put on the ballot a measure to increase the hotel room tax to fund the expansion of the convention center, homeless services, and roads. Uh, you voted against moving it to the March ballot. I don't know if you've necessarily taken a stand on how you would vote or how, whether you'd support that. Will you support it? I have not taken a stand on Okay. That. All right, fair enough. <laughs> uh, and at the same time, we'll be having the mayoral primary. Um, have you uh, picked a, a candidate in that race? And I have not. Okay. <laughs> uh, Councilman, or Councilwoman Montgomery, thank you so much for taking the time to come in. I appreciate it. Thank you.